It is an honor and a blessing for me to have this opportunity to share God's <laughs> word with you one more time. Uh, today we will finish up John chapter 12. and Well, that's the plan at least as of 11.07 a.m. <laughs> we, we will see if that plan changes. Sometimes plans change um, in our uh, week. Um, and so we'll see what, what God brings in the upcoming days and weeks. But this morning, we want to start by looking at verses 12 through 26. John chapter 12, verse 12. On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast, when they heard Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. These things his disciples did not understand at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things to him. So the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify about him. For this reason also the people went and met him because they had heard that he had performed this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These then came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Would you pray with me, please? <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day, and Father, we, we thank you for this season of the year where we celebrate the birth of your Son, the birth of our Savior. Father, we thank you for not only this day and an opportunity to gather together, but we thank you for this place in which we are gathered, Father, your house. And Lord, we are grateful for your word. Father, I pray you'd open your word to us this morning, that you'd speak to us, Lord, that uh, we would go away from this place this morning, not only having worshipped you, but having heard from you. We thank you for this time that we share one with another in your presence, in your house. And we lift up all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> this passage records some events that take place in the last week of Christ's earthly ministry. These things take place just prior to his death, his burial, and resurrection. This passage contains for us a wealth of information and a wealth of insight about who Jesus is and what it means to follow him. And I want to look at this passage with you today in a message entitled, Looking for Jesus. In this passage, I see examples of three different types of people that are spoken of. And the first example that I want to talk to you about is those who were shouting. As Jesus rides into town for the Passover on a donkey, the crowds who've also come up to celebrate the Passover, they are excited. They begin to shout some words from the scripture saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They grab palm branches and they're, they're waving the palm branches. They're shouting, they're singing. They have heard of Christ's power to work miracles and they believe he is coming to free them from the rule of the Romans. So in their excitement, they shout, they sing, they wave palm branches while Jesus enters into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. 
And I love the honesty of John as he writes about this scene. John admits that he and the other disciples did not really fully understand all that was going on. They did not understand that this was Christ fulfilling the scriptures of Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 where we read, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation. He is humble and mounted on the foal of a donkey. Jesus rode into town that day on a donkey to fulfill the scriptures and to demonstrate the character of his kingdom. His kingdom is a spiritual kingdom, not a military kingdom. He rode into Jerusalem on a donkey because he came in peace. And as he enters Jerusalem, the people are shouting, they're waving palm branches, they're making a big scene. There's a whole lot of worship that's going on. Now, last week, we talked about how during a dangerous time, Mary worshipped. Mary cleaned the feet of Jesus with expensive perfume, and she was criticized by some for what she had done. She was criticized for her act of worship. We looked at that, we talked about it, and, and I uh, characterized it as unpopular worship because of the criticism that she received. In this part of chapter 12, we also have this work and this act of worship. Uh, some people might consider to be popular worship because it seems like the whole crowd is joining in. It seems like nobody is criticizing anybody for waving palm branches and shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The whole crowd is shouting in agreement and they are worshiping loudly. But even though the whole crowd seems to be worshiping, I think we need to recognize that, that it is misguided worship. They are not worshiping Jesus for the spiritual salvation he offers. They're not worshiping Jesus because they view him as their spiritual king. They are shouting because they are looking for an earthly king. They are praising Jesus because of what they expect from him, and they expect that Jesus will rid them of the Romans who are ruling over them. They expect Jesus to align his actions with their thoughts, their desires, and their preferences. They expect Jesus to do their will rather than the will of the Father. But it was not the Father's will for Jesus to come at that time to set them free from the rule of the Romans. It was the Father's will that Christ come to set them free from the rule of sin in their lives. They had expectations and Jesus would not meet their earthly expectations. In less than one week, their shouts for Jesus would turn into shouts against Jesus. They did not have a scriptural understanding of the Lord's will or his desire for them, but they shouted loudly. As I was thinking about that this week, I was thinking about the fact that there are many people who shout today who do not have a scriptural understanding of the Lord's will. The things that they shout are not aligned with God's word. The things that they shout are not aligned with his will. The things that they shout are misinformed and misguided. They pick and choose the sayings and the teachings of Christ that they are comfortable with. They pick and choose the teachings and sayings of Christ that resonate with their flesh. And they dismiss and discount any scripture that would make them feel uncomfortable. Any scripture that might promote spiritual growth. Any scripture that might call out sin in their life and call them to engage in honest and prayerful self-reflection. They shout about a Jesus who would never tell anyone to go and sin no more. They shout about a Jesus who on judgment day would never tell anyone, depart from me, I never knew you. They shout about all kinds of things, but they are not shouting about the Jesus of Scripture. 
They are not shouting about the holy, righteous Son of God revealed by God in His Word. They shout about a Jesus who meets the desires of their hearts. They have created a God in their own image. Now, I would be remiss if I did not say that I think all of us are susceptible to falling into misguided worship. I think all of us are susceptible to, to picking and choosing and embracing and shouting about the scriptures that resonate with us. You know, the Bible tells us in several places that there is an ongoing battle between our flesh and our spirit. There is a constant struggle that goes on within us as to whether or not we're going to do the will of the Father or the will of our flesh. Many times we do not even recognize that there is this battle going on inside of us. Many times we do not recognize that there is a battle that has been going on and we have lost that battle and we are now walking in our flesh. You find several passages in God's word that, that speak to us about our need for self-reflection. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, 5 Paul exhorts the church, examine yourselves to see whether or not you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. We are called to consistently, prayerfully examine ourselves to make sure that we are engaged in doing and proclaiming the will of the Father rather than the will of our flesh. The majority of the people who were shouting that day as Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on a donkey, they were shouting based on their will and their desires and their expectations for Christ. So we've talked about those who were shouting. I want to move on to this next set of scriptures and talk to you about those who were seeking. See, John tells us some Greeks came looking for Jesus. And we know that these individuals were God-fearing people because they were going up to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. They come to Philip and they say, we want to see Jesus. You know, maybe they had heard about uh, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Maybe they had heard about him healing uh, the lame, causing the blind to see. Maybe they had heard about all other types of miracles that Christ had done. Maybe they had heard about Jesus cleansing the temple and driving out the money changers. We really don't know what specific thing drove them to seek after Jesus, but we know that they came wanting to know more about Christ. As I read that this week and looked at it, I, I found it curious that when they ask Philip to see Jesus, it seems like Philip hesitates or that he, he balks at that idea just a little bit. He doesn't take them to directly to Jesus. He goes and he gets Andrew. And it's as if Philip is not sure if bringing these people, these Greeks, these Gentiles to Jesus is the right thing to do. Maybe Philip is remembering what Jesus said to the Canaanite woman in Matthew chapter 15. This woman comes asking Jesus to help her daughter who is demon possessed. And Jesus initially responds to her, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. He says, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he tells her that it's not good to throw the children's bread to the dogs. And I love her response. Yes, Lord, but even the little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. I love that. She continues to plead with him. She continues to go to him because she knows that help will not be found anywhere else other than Christ. And Jesus commends her for her great faith. And then he heals her daughter. What a powerful moment that was. To me, it speaks of the great love that Christ has for all people. 
And when Philip did not immediately take those who were seeking Jesus directly to Jesus, maybe he was remembering that incident. Maybe he was remembering what Jesus said about being sent only to the house of Israel. So in remembering all those things and trying to figure things out, maybe Philip hesitated out of confusion. You know, I have found that guys named Philip sometimes tend to overthink things. <laughs> I think Martha would testify that's been her experience too. So for all you Phillips out there, for all you Phillips who might be in here, for anyone else who may tend to overthink things, please hear me. If you know Jesus and someone comes to you wanting to see Jesus, wanting to know Jesus, take them to him. Share the gospel. Take people to the Christ of the scriptures. Take people to the Jesus who lived, died, and rose again to pay the penalty for their sin, for your sin, for all sin. Take people to Jesus because if you don't take them to Christ and his cross, someone else will take them someplace else. And that would be a tragedy. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, we read, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Take people to Jesus. Amen. We want people who are looking for Jesus to find Jesus. Take them to the Lord of lords, the King of kings. Take them to the Son of God who's been revealed to us in God's word. So we've talked about those who are shouting. We've talked about those who are seeking. Let me close by talking about those who are serving. In response to this group of people who have come to see him, Jesus provides us with a wonderful discourse. Uh, he speaks to his disciples, but he's speaking to us about all that is going to take place and his desire for those who would follow him. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus uses this analogy of a grain of wheat falling to the ground. He's speaking of his upcoming death, burial, and resurrection. In the same way that a seed must, be die, must die and be buried in the ground if it's to bring forth fruit, Christ is telling them, I must die, I must be buried, I must do those things to be able to rise again so that God will be glorified and that God's plan of redemption will be fulfilled. And it is through his death, burial, and resurrection that Christ is able to offer redemption and salvation. Through his death, burial, and resurrection, Christ is able to bring forth new life. I love the way Paul says it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. So Jesus is speaking of how he must give his life so that ours can be saved. The hour has come, he said, for him to be glorified. He goes on to say in verses 27 through 28 of John chapter 12, My soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Through giving his life, through his death on the cross, Jesus said, I am going to be glorified. He's talking about being crucified. He's talking about dying for you and dying for me. He's talking about being on the cross, which is a death that the world would view as humiliating and shameful, but he sees it as something that would bring glory to God the Father. That it would give us an opportunity to have our sins forgiven. Give us an opportunity to be reconciled unto God the Father. The way in which he would be able to bear much fruit. Bringing glory to God through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And bringing glory to God the Father is the greatest thing that anyone can do. It is horrible that Jesus had to be beaten 
and that he had to suffer. It's horrible that Jesus had to die, but he willingly sacrificed himself. He willingly gave his life that we may live. As he speaks of his death, his burial, his resurrection, as he speaks of his sacrifice, he also speaks of those who would serve him, those who would follow him. He says his followers must be willing to lose their life. They must be willing to die to their will, their preferences, and their desires if they want to bear fruit which glorifies God the Father. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus tells his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Later in John chapter 20, Jesus is going to tell his disciples, As the Father sent me, so am I sending you. He tells us that where he is, his followers will be. He tells us if we are to serve him, we must love others sacrificially. We must deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow him. We must constantly, constantly be looking for Christ, for where he is, discerning uh, how he is moving and what he desires for us and from us. The author of Hebrews exhorted the church in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He speaks to those who would follow him, to those who would serve him. And if you count yourself in that group, then you must keep your eyes on him. You must prayerfully discern where he is so that you can be there with him. Where he is, that is where we want to be. What he desires, that is what we want to desire. Looking for Jesus. And you know, a lot of people, depending on where they are in their spiritual walk, that might mean something a little bit different. To the person who does not yet know Him as Lord and Savior, looking for Christ might mean discovering the truth about themselves, that they have sinned, that they have fallen short of God's glory, and that they have separated themselves from God the Father. And if they die in that separation, they will be separated from Him for all of eternity. Away from His goodness, away from His grace, away from anything that is beautiful and lovely. The Bible describes such a place as hell. If you're looking for Jesus, that's what you need to do above and beyond all things. If you do not know Him as Lord and Savior, He offers you forgiveness. He offers you salvation. Uh, reconciliation with God the Father. He offers you salvation so that when you die, you'll go to be with Him in glory, in paradise, in heaven. Maybe you already know Him and you're just seeking to know His will. Search the Scriptures. Talk to those who know Him. Talk to those who you know are aligned with His will. He'll reveal Himself to you. If you are truly seeking Jesus, you will find Him. If you truly have questions, He will give you answers. If you truly want eternal life, He will provide that to you. Go to Him. Seek Him out. Find Him. Accept Him as Lord. Would you pray with me, please?